chapter twenty two of the lady of the basement flat by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain mrs merrivale's appeal every one has noticed that the thought of a friend after a spell of forgetfulness is frequently the harbinger of a sudden meeting or of the receipt of a letter or message such happenings are called curious coincidences but personally i don't consider them curious at all or at least no more curious than it is to send a message by telephone and to hear in reply a familiar voice speaking across the space when the heart sends forth a wireless message of love and good will surely if we have in any sense grasped the wonderful power of thought we must believe that the message reaches its destination and calls forth a response right thoughts thoughts of love and pity and helpfulness are prayers winged to heaven and earth bad thoughts mean and grudging and censorious well they injure the person who thinks them so much that there can't be much poison left for the recipient in any case such leaden things can't rise this moralizing leads up to the fact that while my own letter to delphine lay unfinished on my desk a note arrived from ralph maplestone to give me grave news of her husband i am summoned home he wrote in my capacity of vicar's warden while i have been in town poor merrivale has had an attack of influenza which has been pretty serious and has left him rather alarmingly weak i insisted upon calling in a consultant from b whose verdict is that the lungs are seriously threatened i have feared it for some time and am glad that he is now forced to take care he is ordered complete rest and is to get out of england for the spring months i shall be kept busy here for some weeks but expect to run up to town for a day's business now and then when i will give myself the pleasure of calling on you meanwhile will you kindly pass on the news to miss wastneys i know she will be interested i rely on you to fulfil your kind promise by the same post came a letter from charmion tentatively breaking the news that she would not return for christmas several minor reasons had contributed to this decision but the big one was that she was still working out her cure and could do it better in solitude what about me would i go to ireland could i work in a visit to friends rather than think of me sitting alone in my dreary little flat she would put everything on one side and come rushing home dreary little flat indeed i looked round the dainty rose-lit room and laughed a derisive laugh <laughs> it was strange i did not feel a bit depressed life in the basement flat was very full very interesting of late days thrillingly exciting into the bargain i was not at all sure that i wanted to go back to pastime so soon christmas in the flat offered endless possibilities i would have a tree mrs manners should help me her children would come and all the thorolds and their father and mr hallett there should be lots of toys lots of baubles but useful things too things which should truthfully be just what i wanted perhaps i would be noble and forgiving and ask eric and claudia and maureen poor mites it wasn't their fault that their mother wore false pearls the tree should be on christmas eve and on christmas night i would invite the grown-ups to dinner and give them a light dainty feast with never a shadow of roast beef or plum pudding they could do their duty by convention at the midday meal in two minutes time i had thought out the whole menu even the decorations on the table what fun it would be how they would all enjoy it how little mrs manners would revel in the shopping expeditions her presence should be a pretty blouse something pretty bought with a view to what is becoming not to what will be useful and wear for several seasons and then cut up into dusters 
an occasional extravagance is such a tonic to a feminine mind as for the men mr thorold should have a box of cigars mr hallett should have the same and in the deadliest secrecy i would commission each to buy for the other then they would be sure to get the right brand as for pastimes our guest tenant would be delighted to have her stay extended i wondered if the gardener would pine for bridget i wondered if any one would pine for me personally the prospect of occasional calls pleased me better than the thought of meetings in the country under the argus eye of village gossips in the latter case one would be self-conscious and restrained in the former safe from observation doubly sheltered behind wig and spectacles there could be no doubt as to which position afforded the better opportunity of getting to know a man's character i wrote a letter to charmian reassuring her as to christmas in my dreary flat i tore up the unfinished note to delphine and sent another assuring her of my sympathy repeating my offers of help poor little girl her real love for jacky would be in the ascendant now and all the pleasure and vanities for which she had pined would seem trivial things compared with his dear life i did not write to mr maplestone the difficulty of handwriting came in and there was no real necessity to answer his note if i knew delphine she would find it a relief to pour forth her woes on paper i waited confidently for a letter to appear two days passed by three i was growing anxious and debating if i should write again when there came a loud rat-tat at the door and a reply paid telegram was handed in addressed to miss wastney's letter received need urgent unable to leave can you come to-morrow beg you not to refuse delphine i seized a pencil scribbled a hasty expect me by train arriving twelve and having dispatched the promise sat down to consider how i was to keep it what an excitement to think of feeling young again and being able to devote my attention to looking as nice as i could instead of laboriously contriving disfigurements under my bed lived a box wardrobe on wheels in which carefully stretched and padded to avoid creases reposed a selection of garments which were certainly not suited to old miss harding's requirement mentally i reviewed them selected the prettiest and most becoming saw a vision of myself putting the last touches before the glass with bridget's beaming face watching every stage oh it would be an exhilarating variety and easy too perfectly easy i would give the orphan leave of absence for two days and send her rejoicing to stay with me aunt then in leisurely enjoyment i would make my toilette and march complacently into the street we possess no porter in our modest mansions ten to one i should pass through the hall unseen and even if i had the ill luck to encounter a neighbour well if my disguise is good enough to deceive ralph maplestone it can surely defy less interested eyes bridget was as excited as i was she hustled the orphan out of the flat and superintended my toilette as eagerly as though i were dressing for a wedding instead of a country visit praise the fates we'll see you looking yourself again i never was in favour of this dressing up and playing tricks with a face which any one else would be proud to have and to take care of not that you hadn't more sense than i gave you credit for we've been a godsend to this place and if any one doubts it let em look at the kitchen book and see the pounds of good meat i've made into beef tea with me own hands and you running about by day and by night waiting on em all in turns there's no doubt but we've done good but what i say is why not do it with your own face don't be foolish bridget i couldn't do it look at me now i swirled round to face her with a rustle of silk and a flare of skirts do i look the sort of person to wheel out prams 
and give tea-parties to widowers and be looked upon as a prop and support by my neighbours bridget chuckled <laughs> go away with you then said she and that was the end of the discussion i met no one in the hall i met no one in the street i jumped into a taxi at the corner and drove off to the station without running the remotest chance of detection it was so easy that i determined to do it again every now and then just for a change just to remember what it was like to look nice i arrived at the station and took my ticket there was no one i knew upon the platform i walked to the further end and took a seat in an empty first-class carriage the collector came round and looked at the tickets there was a banging all down the length of the train a sharp call take your seats please take your seats the door of my compartment opened and shut ralph maplestone seated himself in the corner opposite mine how do you do miss wastneys said he cool as a cucumber how do you do mr maplestone said i red as a beetroot was it chance was it coincidence was it a deep and laborious plan had he heard from delphine of my coming and rushed to town for the express purpose of returning in my company it looked very like it my wire could not have arrived at the vicarage until after five in the afternoon and the next train to town left at nine p m there was also an early morning one at eight thirty my brain seethed with curious questions but there seemed only a moment's pause before i spoke again have you been staying in town ah oh, his eyes showed a faint flicker of amusement not long you are going down to see delphine i suppose that's good of you she needs bucking up the vicar's pretty bad but with rest and change there's no reason why he shouldn't pick up we are arranging to make things easier for them it will do him no good if she makes herself miserable that's the sort of futile remark that outsiders generally make on these occasions they make me furious i cried glad of an excuse to work off my self-consciousness in a show of indignation perhaps it won't but as long as he belongs to her and she loves him she can hardly be expected to be happy in illness all the sympathy is lavished on the invalid in reality the relations are more to be pitied it's far easier to lie still and bear physical pain than it is to be racked with anxiety and fatigue and responsibility all at the same time he said looking at me with an air of the most profound attention you are thinner than you were your face is thinner we were not talking about my face how long has mr merivale really been ill it's difficult to say he's the sort of fellow who never thinks about himself and delphine is not not exactly noticing i fancy she blames herself now but he never complained and always went on working at full pressure till this attack came on and he went down with a crash and now how does he seem now his forehead wrinkled into lines depressed nervous inclined to be jumpy he has lived for his work and hates the idea of giving up even for a time he has overtaxed his strength for years and his nerves are bound to play up however once we get them off to the sun he'll soon pull round and when do they as soon as possible it is delphine who is putting things off so far as merivale himself is concerned the sooner he starts the better he'll not grow any stronger where he is when are you coming back to pastimes it's uncertain not before christmas is your mother quite well quite thanks you know that i have made miss harding's acquaintance she is a charming old lady i'm so glad you like her i knew you had called nice little flat isn't it he growled his face eloquent with disapproval if you call it nice to live burrowed underground how sane people can consent to live in town 
herded together in a building more like a prison than a home the goodness and grace did not make us all country squires i said shortly whereat he laughed quite an easy genial laugh and twinkled at me with his blue eyes it was extraordinary how natural and at ease he appeared so different from the stiff silent man i had known at escott the journey takes exactly sixty minutes and we talked the whole way for the first twenty minutes i was on my guard nerving myself to say no for the second time with due firmness and finality for the next twenty i was friendly and natural he was behaving so well that he deserved encouragement during the third twenty i said less stared out of the carriage window and felt a disagreeable feeling of irritation and depression he went on talking about books and gardens and parish difficulties and i wasn't interested one bit one may not wish a man to propose to one for the second time but with the echo of vows of undying devotion ringing in one's ears it is rather daunting to go through an hour's tete-a-tete without one personal remark he had said that i was thin perhaps he found me changed in other ways perhaps on meeting me again he found that he did not like me as much as he had believed perhaps he was glad that i had said no we parted at the vicarage gate he apparently quite comfortable and composed i in the lowest depths what a change from last time the door opened and before i had time to blink delphine's arms were round me and a hot wet cheek pressed against mine she was sobbing in a hard breathless way which made my heart leap but even on the way to her sitting-room i gathered that my first fear was unfounded jacky was the same in bed so tired always so tired seems to care for nothing hardly even the blue eyes opened in incredulous misery for me when people are very weak they can't care it takes strength even to love at least to realize that one loves i never knew a man who adored his wife more than mr merryvale does you but i expect it suits him better just now to lie quietly and snooze rather than to hold your hand and watch you cry she looked guilty at that and tossed her head with a spice of her old spirit but the next moment her breath caught in a sob and she cried desperately oh heaven it's all awful other things everything far worse than you know i'm the most miserable creature in the world i think i shall go mad i sent for you because hold hard for one moment i'm hungry i need my lunch so do you by the look of you shall we have it first and tackle the serious business afterwards in your room where we shan't be interrupted there will be plenty of time i needn't leave till five i ordered cutlets and an omelette and coffee afterwards all the things you liked best when you were here but i can't eat a bite it would choke me i hate the sight of food very well then you can watch me eat mine i said with the callousness of one who had heard dozens of people declare the same thing and then watched them tuck into a square meal delphine proved another protester to add to the list she ate her share of the meal with no sign of choking and brightened into acutest interest at hearing of my escort from town the fork stopped halfway to her mouth her eyes widened to saucer size in the sheer surprise of the moment she forgot her grief and anxieties but but how could he be there he was here last night quite late ten o'clock walked down after dinner to hear how jacky was i made a vague sweeping gesture which was designed to express a lack of all responsibility concerning the squire's eccentricities but delphine's suspicions were aroused and she was not to be easily put off he must have gone up by the workman's train and yours left at eleven how very peculiar and he said nothing last night did i tell him you were coming she wrinkled her brows in the effort to remember yes i did 
he said something about taking me for a drive to freshen me up and i said you would be here before lunch evelyn he couldn't possibly have gone to meet you evidently she suspected nothing i tried to look composed and natural and said lightly it seems preposterous doesn't it he certainly did not say so she stared at me curiously what did you talk about about us did he say anything about me of course what do you suppose we had quite an argument because he seemed to think it a pity that you should injure yourself by fretting and i said i didn't see how you could do anything else she smiled and tilted her head her complacency restored that was it i suppose he wanted to talk to you before you saw me he is good and you argued with him you say disagreed i suppose oh well men are always more tender-hearted than women i felt annoyed and munched in silence staring fixedly at my plate if this particular man was so much more understanding why had she summoned me from town after lunch delphine ran upstairs to see her husband for a few minutes and then returned to me in her little sitting-room he was tired she said and hoped to sleep until tea she had not told him of my visit he was so listless and apathetic that it worried him to talk or to have people talk to him i don't believe he will ever be the same again people always say that in the middle of an illness but they find their mistake later on after a long rest the vicar will be better than he has been for years and it will be your business to see that he never works so hard again you are always longing for a change delphine think how you will enjoy switzerland sitting out in the crisp clear air looking at those glorious mountains with no house or parish to worry over nothing to do but wait on your dear man and watch him growing stronger every day she looked at me dumbly while the colour faded out of her cheeks and the pretty curved lips twitched and trembled i saw her clasp her hands and brace herself against her chair and knew that the moment for confession had come and that it was difficult to find words no worry she repeated slowly no worry but that's just what is killing me i'm so worried so worried that i feel sometimes evelyn as if i were going out of my mind you mean about your husband i asked but the question was really put as a lead i knew she was not referring to illness delphine shook her head that is bad enough but it is not the worst the worst is that through me through my wretched selfish vain discontented folly i i've made it difficult for him even to get well i i've got into a horrible mess evelyn and when he hears of it when he has to hear he will be so worried so miserable so disappointed that it will bring on a relapse and he will probably be worse than before we can neither of us be happy again never never any more sounds pretty bad i said startled but there must be some way out or you would have not sent for me to help you you are going to tell me the whole truth delphine half confidences are no use you will speak honestly and let me speak honestly to you oh yes you will do whether i allow you or not i know you well then i bent forward staring full in her face let's get to the point is it another man her face answered without the need of words amazed resentment blazed out of her blue eyes another man i should think not how hateful of you evelyn i'm despicable enough but i love jacky there's no other man in the world for me of course she paused and faintly smiled as at a soothing recollection people admire me i can't help that and there's no harm so long as i don't flirt there's the squire i think if i were not married he might want but i am married and it's the honest truth that i've never said a word to a man since our marriage that i shouldn't be willing for jacky to hear no it's not that it's money then i said quickly so the squire would want would he oh indeed delphine you've been getting into debt 
oh how did you guess she turned her head over her shoulder as though afraid some one might overhear oh evelyn nobody knows but you i think i've been mad goodness knows what i expected to happen in the end i was in a crazy rebellious mood tired to death of being dull and careful and i had a wild spell of extravagance ordered whatever i wanted ran up bills in town i went to your dressmaker i was sick of making my own clothes and looking a frump i'm young and i'm pretty i wanted to look nice while i could everyone said i did look nice but she's a terror that woman of yours i had no idea of the bill you did not ask for estimates in advance how could i i didn't even know what to order i just said a pretty dress for the afternoon a hat with roses an evening cloak descriptions like that and there was the habit too and little things oddments they grow into mountains and i bought furniture to make my room look pretty and homelike you remember you said i deserved to have one nice room apparently this extravagance could also be traced to my influence it was useless to waste any more words i went straight to the point how much oh she started and shivered i'm ashamed to say and now we are going away and the bills have to be paid i'm a new customer and they keep sending them in and the house books they have run on jacky gave me some money i meant to pay them honestly i did evelyn but somehow the money frittered away till there wasn't enough left i paid some but there are others left jacky would hate it if we left the parish in debt how much i repeated and she flushed to the roots of her hair over a hundred nearer two i'm afraid evelyn it was more than i had expected i had to make fresh calculations and revise several plans subconsciously i had known that the trouble was monetary and had made a special study of my pass-book before leaving the flat i can let you have a hundred at once and settle the rest of the bills for you next month if that will do she looked at me with tear-filled eyes do you think i deserve it i'm not sure that you do but mr merivale does he shan't have any new worry just now if i can prevent it you are sure you have told me everything delphine that is all i'll show you the bills i knew you would help you were the only person i could bear to ask but you did not wait to be asked i do love you evelyn and i shall never forget you understand don't you that it is only a loan i shall pay you back i know you will when you can it's a comfort that you need not hurry i can wait for years you will have to i'm afraid in three years i hadn't a penny of my own when i married but an old aunt left us all two hundred and fifty pounds to be paid when we were twenty-five that's my fortune jacky teases me about it for i was always planning what i will do when it comes i had decided to buy a tiny two-seater and learn to drive i told him that it would be useful in the parish but really i was thinking of the fun for myself are you shocked not a bit well it would be a waste of energy if you were for i shall never have it now the money will go to repay you and to pay interest on the loan i shall pay five per cent i only get four i insist upon five i should like to feel that you had made a good investment she waved her hand with a lordly air which made me laugh and she laughed too with obvious enjoyment oh my dear what a relief i shall sleep happily to-night for the first time for weeks i can never tell you how wretched i felt so worried and guilty and trapped honestly it will be a lesson for life you have helped me for the moment but my worst punishment is to come when he is well again quite strong and fit i must tell jacky her face clouded he won't say much but his face it will be an awful ordeal but i suppose it will be good for me i thought but did not say that it would be good for him too the shock might teach him to be more understanding in his treatment of his girl wife 
soon after that i suggested paying a flying call on the general and delphine assented eagerly no doubt feeling as i did myself that it would be a relief to be spared a further tete-a-tete the dear old man was delighted to see me and was eager to hear when charmion and i were coming back to pastimes something in his manner in the way his old eyes searched my face made me suspect that he knows i travelled to town alone and arrived at the flat feeling tired and dispirited bridget wanted to know if i had seen anything of her man she also seemed a trifle out of temper some people she said darkly don't know when they are well off End of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the lady of the basement flat by mrs george de horned vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain a brute and a revelation christmas has come and gone the little girls left us a fortnight before and the flat felt very quiet without them but i busied myself arranging for the fray the tree was a huge success so was the dinner next day nevertheless i shed tears on my pillow when i went to bed for if a solitary woman is ever justified in feeling lone and lorn it is certainly at the season when everybody who possesses a family rushes to it as a matter of course it was very gratifying to have made other people happy but i had a hungry longing to be made happy myself by an unfortunate coincidence neither cathy's greeting nor charmion's nor delphine's arrived until the twenty seventh and aunt eliza's turkey never arrived at all having presumably lost its label and been eaten by the postman as treasure trove the one and only parcel from a distance came from mr maplestone he had called the week before and asked permission to send evergreens from the hall he said it was so difficult to get holly with berries on it in town and all children loved red berries presumably his trees grew crackers as well as berries for about a dozen boxes of the most gorgeous varieties were enclosed in the crate there was no letter but just a card with for the children written in a corner on boxing day i made winifred and marion write letters of thanks a weary process from which they emerged splattered with tears and ink why are you laughing miss harding they inquired resentfully i did not tell them that i was chuckling at my own cleverness in avoiding a personal acknowledgment i did not know that the squire had ever seen my writing but he might have done no risks should be run delphine and her husband are settled at davos and he is beginning to improve she writes sweet little letters and i'm sure this illness has arrived at a providential moment the shock of realizing that her jacky's life was in danger was like a lightning flash lighting up a dark landscape in its blaze she saw revealed the true value of things and the sloping path on which her feet were set i don't expect her to grow up all at once settle down to all work and no play and behave as though she were forty instead of twenty-two i don't expect the vicar to give up being absent-minded and exacting but i do honestly believe that it will do him good to have his shock and that he is just enough to realize his own share of the blame then they will kiss and begin again and things will go better because there will be understanding to leaven love talking of understandings there was a marvellous calm in the flat overhead for some nights in early january and bridget informed me that mr nineteen had been taken to a nursing home to have an operation since our tragic encounter mrs nineteen her real name is travers and i have exchanged furtive bows when we have met in the hall i always felt guilty and anxious to make it up and had an instinct that she felt the same 
though neither had the courage to speak but of course after the operation i had to stop and inquire she flushed and said pretty well thank you the doctors are satisfied but it will be a long cure a week later i met her coming in with a book under her arm she had been reading aloud her husband felt the time so long for an active man it was a great trial to lie in bed to judge by her face it was an exhausting experience to his wife to sit by his side i said impetuously if mr travers would allow me i should be so glad to read aloud to him sometimes when you are not able to go i am fond of reading aloud i believe i do it pretty well i don't she said dejectedly it makes me yawn john says i mumble she looked at me sharply distrustfully you are very kind but it's too much why should you i'd like to if you will let me i i was rude to you that day i've been remorseful ever since if you'd allow me to do this i should feel that i was forgiven you spoke the truth she said shortly and i brought it on myself i had no business to complain about those poor children knowing why they were here but there are some moods in which one is bound to have a vent you hurt my pride of course but it's not the first time she bit her lip turned aside for a moment and then added quickly i didn't tell john thank you i'm glad of that he'll be more willing to let me come please tell him that i'm so sorry to have disturbed him and want to make up by helping him while he is ill my time is my own i can go any day at any time to read any book she made no promise and for several days seemed to avoid meeting me face to face then one morning she came to the door and asked to see me some business had arisen which necessitated a day out of town her husband dreaded being left alone did i really mean my kind offer and if so would to-morrow afternoon i went he is a dark sharp-featured man with thick eyebrows and a chronic scowl he also looks shockingly ill and is growing a beard the combination is enough to strike terror into the feminine soul the very maid who opened the door looked pityingly at me when i pronounced his name as for his nurse she fairly bounced with relief when i was announced her expression said as plainly as words i've had my turn now you can have yours harding he said graciously oh yes you are the woman who bangs the doors he let me read for two hours on end and then said stupid book i can't think how they ever get published but when i left he asked when will you come again which was as far in the way of thanks as it is possible for him to get for the next three weeks i went constantly to the home and never once did that man say a gracious word if i arrived late he growled and said thought you were never coming hardly worth beginning at all if i was early his greeting was i was just having a nap haven't closed my eyes since two this morning and now you have roused me up if i read a book he preferred a newspaper if i read a newspaper it crackled and worried his head if i made a remark he disagreed if i was silent was there no news nothing going on to tell a poor wretch tied to his bed if i said he looked better he would have me to know that the nurses and doctors alike were deluding him with lies he knew for a fact that he was dying fast if i said he looked tired he felt better than he had done all week it was impossible to please him impossible to win a smile or a gracious word never have i met a human being so twisted and warped in mind to go into his room is like entering a black tunnel one leaves it with the feeling of breaking bonds the matron of the home is a brisk capable woman with a face full of kindly strength we generally met and exchanged a few words on stairs or landing and it was easy to see that her patience was wearing thin 
there came a day when she met me with a red face beckoned me into her private room and poured forth a stream of angry confidences i really must speak to some one about mr travers his poor wife has enough to bear i can't trouble her the man is insufferable he upsets the whole house his nurse has just been to me in tears nothing will please him he rings his bell all day and half the night and for nothing literally nothing just an excuse to give trouble we have honestly done our best more than our best with such a patient it is easier to give in than to protest but i'm beginning to think we've been wrong he is not getting on as quickly as he should i believe his temper is keeping him back i'm sure of it you are an expert at healing and i'm a beginner but i'm a great believer in the power of the mind he is poisoning himself he is poisoning everyone else i can't submit to have my whole house upset if he were fit to be moved he should be out of it to-day it's all i can do to be civil and not blaze out and tell him what i think well i shouldn't try what she looked at me sharply oh you agree you feel the same you think i dare i do i go a step further and say it's your duty he is a bully and probably no one has ever dared to show him how he appears to other people but for the time being you are in command while he is here he is supposed to obey give it to him hot and strong tell him that he is injuring himself and is a misery to every one else that you are only keeping him because it would do him harm to be removed it's true she cried it's every word true the man is a miasma she stared at me in sudden amaze why do you laugh <laughs> oh oh i was just thinking thinking of a man whom i used to denounce as bad-tempered a dear kind thoughtful unselfish englishman with a with a bluster i can never call it temper again after knowing mr travers he has taught me a lesson she laughed too and shrugged her shoulders <laughs> oh that i like a man with a will of his own and the pluck to speak out a bluster as you call it clears the air and is quite a healthful influence but this other well miss harding you have given the casting vote when are you coming again thursday afternoon i think mrs travers is busy then has to go out of town that's all right then i'll have it out with him before lunch and leave you to calm him down in the afternoon oh mean i cried but she only laughed opened the door and hustled me into the hall evidently her mind was made up when thursday afternoon arrived it found miss harding entering the ogre's bedroom with a smile tightly glued on her lips and a heart beating uncomfortably fast beneath her ugly flannel blouse from the bed a pair of gimlet-like eyes surveyed her sharply pale lips twisted and showed a snarl of teeth he volunteered no remark however and i wasted not a second in opening my book and beginning to read as a refuge against conversation i could feel the scrutiny of his eyes upon my face but i read on steadily never looking up for nearly an hour when the story came to an end have you had enough reading for to-day or would you care to hear one of the articles in this review he glared at me and said coldly so you are in the conspiracy too women are all alike sitting here all smiles and flummery to my face and then going away to abuse me behind my back that's not true i cried hotly at least it's a very unfair representation there was no necessity for me to come here at all i've done it because you were a neighbor and ill and i wanted to help you even more to help your wife as for smiles and flummery as you express it there's been no chance of anything so friendly you have allowed no chance you don't deny i suppose that you joined with matron in abusing me as a monster of wickedness i said you had the worst temper i had ever met so you have 
i said i believed that you poisoned yourself as well as every one near you so i do all the more credit to me for giving you so much of my time he lay silent staring into my face it was plain the man had received a shock for once in his life he had been shown a picture of himself as others saw him and in the seeing something had been hurt conscience vanity amour propre it was impossible to say which and now his brain was at work trying to assimilate the new thought all the time i had been reading he had been pondering and raging probably he had not heard a single word you women he began again you women talk of ministering angels all very fine for a few days while the novelty lasts after that a poor beggar can suffer tortures and get nothing but revilings for bad temper would you be an angel of meekness if you had to go through what i am bearing now i should probably be exceedingly difficult and fretful at times there would be other times especially when i was getting better when i should feel overflowing with gratitude and should say so to the people who had been patient with me through the bad times words words he snarled scornfully men judge by deeds if you want my character you can hear it from the men with whom i have had to do i am a churchman i go to church every sunday of my life i was once vicar's churchwarden for three years poor vicar what those three years must have been i have known whole parishes set by the ears by just one warped self-opinionated man who put his own pet theories before anything else and went about sowing dissension splitting up a hitherto united people into two opposing camps i said with an air of polite inquiry and did you part good friends he did not answer but the expression on his face was eloquent enough i knew without being told suddenly he broke out at a fresh tangent i suppose my wife i held up my hand authoritatively no please don't blame your wife she has never mentioned you except to pity and sympathize her one thought has been for you how to help how to please of course mr travers the people here and myself have only known you lately and this illness must have been coming on for some time probably it has well it has made you bad-tempered hasn't it but your wife knew you before when you were loving and gentle so her judgment must be more true with my usual softness i was beginning to pity the poor wretch and to try to let him down gently but once again his face was eloquent at the words loving and gentle an involuntary grimace twisted the grim features memory refused to reproduce the picture he said abruptly my wife is a good woman that virago of a matron told me this morning if she'd been in her place she'd have run away years ago <sighs> well mary has stuck to me she doesn't want to go it's not always the softest spoken men who make the best husbands that hallett fellow whom thorold is so thick with he belongs to my club i knew something about him when i lived in america long ago how do you suppose he treated his wife his wife he hasn't got a wife oh hasn't he not now perhaps but he had a little of him went a long way she ran away from him on her honeymoon what do you think of that what kind of man can he have been to make a woman leave him in a month something happened inside my head there was a shock a whirl a blinding darkness followed by a flash of light mr travers had said america and the word had a terrible significance i sat stunned into silence and mr travers obviously gloated over my discomfiture pretty condemning eh? 
she was an heiress pots of money fine-looking girl too i saw her once too pale and washed out for my taste but with an air forget her name something high-flown and romantic like herself well she left him and that was the end of it never heard a word of her since romantic name an heiress fine-looking pale one by one the clues accumulated step by step the evidence mounted up i said faintly has he tried tried to find her searched the world almost went off his head i believe he'd made a mess of it of course but he was crazy about her broken his heart ever since you can see it in his face my wife has no patience with her she'd married for better or worse whatever happened she was a poor thing to throw up the sponge in a month what's the matter you look faint i-i am i must go some other day i gasped vaguely i went out into the passage and sat down on an oak chest the world seemed rocking around me i was so stunned that i could not feel End of chapter 23chapter twenty four of the lady of the basement flat by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain it's a queer world edward hallett and charmian charmian and edward hallett the combination of those two names struck me dumb oh it was madness the most inconceivable the most preposterous madness and yet and yet the more i thought the more the links seemed to fit in he was of the right age the right nationality the few words of description which had fallen from her lips applied accurately to his appearance i went home and sat in stunned silence staring into space i went to bed and lay awake for hours still pondering still puzzling i rose in the morning and wandered about the flat like a lost dog unable to work unable to rest unable to eat by evening i was in such a state of nerves that it seemed impossible to endure the suspense a moment longer the prospect of another wakeful night gave the final touch to my impatience i scribbled a note to mr thorold begging him to come down at once and sent to the orphan upstairs to deliver it he came at once quite anxious and perturbed was i ill had i had bad news was there anything he could do i motioned him to a chair and began vaguely not bad news at least a shock i've had a shock it has distressed me terribly i couldn't sleep it was mr travers i was reading to him again yesterday and he said something about mr hallett it appears that he knew him years ago mr thorold's face hardened i had seen him in almost every phase of sadness and anxiety but never with that flash in the eye that sternness of the lips his voice was cold and sharp travers indeed and what had travers to say nothing good if i know the man he he spoke of mr hallett's wife and you were not aware that he had a wife it is an old story miss hardings an old sore is it necessary to tell one's whole life history to to a, an acquaintance no no of course not don't think me presumptuous and inquisitive i should never have mentioned it if i had not a reason a good reason have i ever seemed to pry into your affairs he softened at that never never you have been all that is tactful all that is kind i i do trust you miss harding but this affair of hallett's gets me on the raw he has suffered tortures i have seen his suffering and i can't help feeling bitter against that woman she left him that's what you heard i suppose yes and so soon it was a tragedy indeed mr thorold will you answer just one question it can do no harm it can give away no secrets what was her christian name 
he looked at me keenly for a moment and then said quietly charmian i lay back in my chair and shut my eyes never in my life have i fainted but i think i must have come very near it then everything turned black for a moment my very heart seemed to stop mr thorold's voice sounded far away as he cried anxiously you are ill faint i'll open the window give you more air then with an eagerness which could not be suppressed you know her hallett's wife is it possible you've met her or or have you only heard his anxiety made his voice shake he was as much overcome as i was myself for six years he added tragically six years he has searched the world i i know a charmian she left her husband it may be a coincidence but it seems strange she had good cause oh i don't deny it enough to alienate any woman i don't wonder at her going at first but but it was cruel to give him no chance to explain it was about money he pretended to love her for herself to know nothing about her fortune and afterwards a letter came that is my charmian story is it his yes yes this is a wonderful thing that the discovery should have come through you and that you should have appealed to me of all people the only man on his side who can tell you the truth is it coincidence miss harding i clasped my hands to still their trembling better than coincidence it is providence we've prayed for them you and i for the friends we love most and now now it seems as if through us oh mr thorold explain explain you believe in him still yet you confess that he was wrong what explanation can he give i love hallett he said solemnly like a brother more than a brother i believed him to be at this moment the best man i know we were at school together he was the only son of a wealthy man until he was twenty-one he was brought up in an atmosphere of such luxury as we in england can hardly imagine americans are fond of going one better than the rest of the world in some cases the extravagance of their moneyed classes amounts to profligacy hallett's father was a notorious example for many years then just as edward came of age there was a colossal smash he lost everything practically fretted himself to death left the lad to fight his own way to expect the boy to understand economy after such an upbringing was preposterous he literally did not understand the value of money he got into debt more and more deeply into debt as the years went on i am not defending him as blameless of course he should have pulled up faced the worst and started afresh but i do say that it was a hard test and that he had many excuses i nodded ideas of economy like most other ideas are comparative i have never known fabulous riches but i should manage badly as a poor woman up to this point i could sympathize with edward hallett mr thorold continued eagerly well just when matters were at their worst a casual acquaintance happened to speak of a young english heiress and it occurred to edward for the first time that marriage might cut the knot he arranged to meet the girl it was a deliberate plan oh i see you have heard her story but what she evidently did not would not understand was that when they did meet he fell in love with her for herself she was his mate his ideal the one woman in the world who had power to awake his best self to make him selfless and in earnest about life he was overcome with shame at the remembrance of his own scheming at one time he believed it to be his duty to punish himself by leaving her without saying a word but his passion was too strong and circumstances hurried on the marriage her aunt died yes she told me oh but why did he pretend why didn't he tell her that he knew about the money his face fretted into lines he looked terribly distressed 
ah that hits me hard he wrote to me miss harding we had kept up a correspondence in intervals since our school days and he had an exaggerated faith in my advice his conscience was torturing him he put the whole case to me should he tell her should he confess he hated the idea of marrying under false pretenses on the other hand he hated as any lover would hate to lower her opinion perhaps to plant the seeds of future suspicions her silence as to her own wealth seemed to show that she had dreaded a mercenary love that it was sweet to her to feel that he was in ignorance he guessed that she was storing up the news as a sweet secret to be revealed to her husband well as i say he put the whole case before me and i i advised him to keep silent he had wronged her in intent but not in deed for no man could love more deeply more disinterestedly than he then loved her every word proved that it was a wonderful letter written straight from the heart i interrupted in breathless haste have you got it did you keep it can you find it now to my unspeakable relief he nodded his head i can it's not often that i keep letters but this was an exception i was naturally anxious about giving the right advice i put the letter in my pocket-book to read and re-read then just the day before the wedding i caught a chill was in bed for a month with pleurisy the first news i heard on getting up was that she had gone at once i thought of the letter and was thankful i kept it i locked it away in my safe i felt that some day when she was found later on i wrote to her lawyers and tried to bully them into giving me her address i meant to send it to her myself and force her to believe but they swore that they knew no more than i did myself liars no it was true she was ill for months in bed absolutely cut off oh well he shrugged helplessly we were all at cross purposes it seems i believed that they were lying and would continue to lie i never tried them again but the letter is there in my safe and it is his best witness miss harding where is she how do you come to know her she's in italy she's coming home to me she's my friend we we live together not here but in the country we share a house he stared i realized how incongruous the arrangement must appear i realized something else too and that was that the time had come when to this man at least miss harding must show herself in her true colours charmian must hurry home i must wire to demand her presence happiness was waiting for her and not one day one hour should the darling wait in ignorance the dreary little flat was about to become the scene of blissful reconciliation of a new radiance of life and hope it was not conceivable that i could mar the sacredness of such a time by masquerading in an assumed character as mr thorold was bound to know it would simplify arrangements if he knew at once i jumped up tingling with excitement almost too impatient to speak mr thorold this is a most adventurous afternoon i have something to tell you about myself it will explain how it comes about that charmian and i wait for me here for a quarter of an hour i'll come back but there is something i must do first you'll understand when i come back please wait i hurried out rang for bridget ordered her to get rid of the orphan and come back to help the wardrobe was pulled from beneath the bed off came the spectacles and wig my face was washed free from the disfiguring marks my hair was coiled a dainty blue gown slipped over my head the quarter of an hour grew into a half the sound of pacing footsteps sounded through the wall i laughed slipped my feet into satin slippers and threw open the drawing-room door he had his back towards me at that moment he wheeled round started stared made a curious jerking bow his face showed no sign of recognition only 
surprise and a veiled impatience mr thorold i believe i said smiling his forehead knitted into lines he stared more closely billy's father i believe i said smiling more broadly the man who ate up my sandwiches oh you 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 minx he gasped loudly oh it was gloriously amusing edward hallett and charmion were nowhere for the moment he could do nothing but gasp and stare walk round me examine me from one point of view and then another gasp and exclaim again you you, you are miss harding miss harding was you am i dreaming or is this real life how did you do it why did you do it but but your mouth is a different shape this beats anything i ever knew you used to look round-shouldered why 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 how could you be so mad then i made him sit down and told him the whole story from the beginning and like everyone else he disapproved violently at first and then by slow degrees came round to my own point of view like bridget he wanted to know why i couldn't play fairy godmother to the mansions with my own face but when i asked him if i could have done so much for him he acknowledged hastily that i could not his expression half horrified half shy spoke more eloquently than his words no you see it would not have worked old miss harding had a pull over evelyn wastney's my name is evelyn wastney's by the way but that is a secret between us for the moment and i am charmion fane's friend just as you are edward hallett's and the good good god is going to give us the joy of seeing them happy together again mr thorold they have both been to blame they have both had a share in spoiling their own lives we won't give them another chance you and i as staid level-headed outsiders are going to stage manage their reconciliation how are we going to manage it listen i said listen it's a queer world it's a very queer world people have said so before but i wish to say it again to shout it aloud at the pitch of my voice hardly had i changed back into miss harding and finished my evening meal when a knock came to the door and there entered mrs travers furious she had returned from her day in the country had seen her husband that afternoon had heard from his lips what i had dared to think and to say if she had been defending a homing dove she could not have been more outraged more aflame she wished me to understand once and for all that for the future no communication no acquaintance of any kind was possible between us she would pass me by in the street without a glance oh very well End of chapter twenty four Chapter twenty five of the Lady of the Basement Flat by Mrs. George de Horn Vasey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two Glorified Beings. I wired to Charmion, return at once, urgently needed, and her reply came back with all possible speed. Meet me, Euston, Thursday. I knew she would come she would imagine that the need was mine and bless her would speed night and day to my aid and what would she find my reeling brain refused to realize the dramatic scenes which lay ahead after much cogitation i determined to close the flat and take a small suite of rooms at an hotel for the next week under the circumstances it would be a relief to be among strangers and away from interested neighbours who might take it into their heads to pay a call at the most crucial moment to say nothing of the orphan and her friends in adjoining flats who would be exercised about the strange doings in the basement flat so it was as evelyn wastney's that i sallied to euston on that eventful thursday and a somewhat tired and sleepy charmion 
was obviously a trifle disappointed to find that she was not to be taken home i have had such a dose of hotels darling you talked of my dreary little flat and you wrote back that it was a bower it has suited you it is easy to see that and your mad scheme has been a success you were very vague in your reports gave me no particulars you didn't want letters for a long time you didn't write at all oh well now we can talk you must tell me all your adventures you look well very well what's the trouble evelyn i never said it was trouble she looked at me sharply fearfully instead of being reassured my answer seemed to have excited her fears not trouble then evelyn what is it tell me quickly don't quibble are you in love engaged don't be absurd i've been miss harding remember wait till you see me i had lessons in making up and i really look the part in love indeed but i knew that my colour was mounting and i could feel the burn of it in my cheeks charmion's lips twitched and her dear eyes grew misty and sad it's hateful of me but i don't want to lose you i'd be a lonely soul i put my hand over hers but said nothing her words had saddened me for they accurately described my own feelings you are well there is no trouble you are not in love then what was the urgent need are you sorry to be here yes if you are going to prevaricate and hedge i've thrown every plan to the winds to come tearing back the least you can do i know i know and i will after dinner give me till eight o'clock to enjoy you and to calm my nerves it's good news but it upsets our plans i needed you here to talk over and to arrange can't you leave business and just be homey with me for an hour or two after all this time she laughed how good it was to hear that soft low laugh and to feast my eyes on her exquisite self even after a two days journey charmion looked elegant i believe she would look well groomed on a desert island some women seem born with this gift it wasn't given to me i can be untidy on the slightest provocation indeed i can there's any amount of chit-chat to get through apart from serious problems you've done me out of my pair of shopping evelyn but i've a box full of trophies for you all the same wherever i went i picked up some token to prove that i remembered you all the time oh cheers cheers i cried fervently that's a good hearing it is more blessed to give than to receive but now and then as a variety it is refreshing to have an innings oneself she laughed at that gripped my arm and said oh evelyn <laughs> you are dear it's good to be with you it's good to be back and we chatted in great contentment for the rest of the drive there were several hours to spare before dinner i made charmion take a bath and then go really and truly to bed until seven o'clock when i woke her and issued orders for her prettiest most becoming frock grey of course a mist of silver and cloudy gauze when she came into the little sitting-room she looked fresh and radiant younger than i had ever beheld her looking at her i was suddenly reminded of a line in one of dear robert louis stevenson's beautiful prayers cleanse from our hearts the lurking grudge how can any immortal being made in god's own image expect to be happy and healthful while he or she is cherishing bitter grudging feelings against a fellow-man charmion's battle had been a long uphill fight but it was won at last the sign of victory was in her face now for the victor's crown dinner was cleared away the waiter placed coffee on a small table and disappeared charmion piled up the cushions at one end of the sofa 
nestled against them and said smilingly now i've been very patient but not another moment can i wait there's an air of mystery about you evelyn a muffled excitement which intrigues me vastly oh you've tried very hard you kept up the chatter but it's been hard work your thoughts have strayed half the time you have not heard my replies your eyes are dark and big dilated like an excited child's if you had not denied it so stoutly i should feel convinced that there was a man my dear this concerns you not me charmian can't you guess it's wonderful wonderful news can't you imagine whom it is about you told me your story but not his name your name when i heard it it conveyed nothing to me when i met him she held out her hands as if to ward off a blow after all my fencing the great news had come blurting out without preface or preparation white as a sheet she stared back at me with anguished eyes met you edward you've met and and spoken i know him well he's a close friend almost a brother of the man whose child was ill and whom i helped to nurse another tenant in the flats i think i mentioned him a darling child we thought he would die we grew intimate comforting one another waiting day after day you mentioned me he recognized the name no i was miss harding evelyn and her life were things apart i've never spoken of them to my neighbours it was pure chance pure providence but he knows you've told him he knows i'm here not yet you had to know first and to hear to read his defence but he is to know to-night his friend will tell him it will break your heart charmian for you have done him a wrong and have wasted all these years but it will fill you with joy as well for at last you can believe you must believe in his loyalty it is there for you to see in a letter to his friend received just before you were married mr thorold has kept it he gave it to me so that you might see it with your own eyes but still she sat motionless half paralyzed it would appear by the suddenness the unexpectedness of the revelation making no effort to take the letters which i held out i put them into her hand speaking in slow gentle tones read darling read there are two letters for mr thorold has drafted out the substance of his own reply he feels that much of the responsibility lies on his shoulder it is such a joy to him such a joy to feel that he has this chance to make good it's not a dream darling it's true the long long nightmare is over read your letters and wake up i pressed the envelope into her slack hands kissed her cold cheek and hurried from the room she must be alone when she read those healing words even the dearest friend would be an intruder at that moment my own heart was beating at express speed as i descended the stairs and walked along the corridors which led to the drawing-room i did not hurry but rather intentionally lingered by the way the great mirrors on the walls reflected a bright-eyed eager girl whom even at this engrossed moment it was a pleasure to recognize as myself i am so tired of the reflection of old miss harding in a far corner of the room the two men were waiting mr thorold came quickly forward i nodded and he took his friend by the arm and led him towards the door edward hallett's face was fixed tense with emotion he glanced neither to right nor to left was oblivious of the outer world mr thorold was to lead him to the room where charmian sat close the door and leave them face to face hardly would she have finished reading the letters 
than her husband would stand before her oh what a meeting what a meeting what a rolling away of the stone thank god for giving me my share in bringing it about wenham thorold came back and sat by my side we were both shaking with excitement but we talked resolutely to pass the time i asked him if mr hallett had been told of my dual personality and he smiled and said oh yes yes he was interested as much interested as he could be in anything outside but not surprised he and i were constantly puzzled by your extraordinary youth the get-up was excellent but your manner your movements they did not belong to an elderly woman circumstances favoured you of course you were naturally quiet and reserved on our first meeting and then billy's illness cast a gloom over us all every one seems older in a period of anxiety but as soon as the cloud lifted your vitality asserted itself he looked at me anxiously this this reunion will make a difference to your life it will take away your friend yes it will my friends all go i said a little bitterly i am trying not to think of myself but only to rejoice for her but it is hard that house in the country you shared it together couldn't you make it your home instead of the flat it would be more suitable this fairy godmother scheme is possible for a few months with a home in the background to which you can return at any moment but now that you will be alone you are too young it does not seem right couldn't you he looked at me apologetically carry on the same work in the country in your own name make the house a country resort for lame dogs who need a rest for example there would be plenty of applicants it's impossible i can't explain i can never return to pastimes alone i spoke shortly the subject was difficult so far i had not thrashed it out even in thought mr thorold shot a quick keen glance instinctively i knew where his thoughts were wandering he was thinking of the bluff country squire who had been so kind to his own little girls remembering that he came from the same neighbourhood that evelyn wastneys and he had been friends the stupid colour flamed in my cheeks i made haste to turn the conversation from myself it will make a difference to you too you will miss your friend yes but i have borne the great loss miss wastneys i can spare him gladly to his joy when one has known the completeness of a real marriage and then been left alone it would be impossible to grudge my friends urge me to marry again my girl herself said she wished it if i had been less completely happy i might have done it for the children's sake as it is i can never put another in her place but i need a woman in my life i feel that but i want a mother a sister not a wife can't you evolve a real miss harding who will look after me and my poor bairns it was an hour later when the message came summoning us to return to the sitting-room the two were standing to receive us glorified beings exalted above the earth oh i can't write about it we clung together they spoke glowing words of love and thanks and appreciation they looked past us into each other's eyes it was wonderful wonderful but oh it made me feel desperately desperately lonely end of chapter twenty five Chapter Twenty Six of the Lady of the Basement Flat by Mrs. George de Horn Vesey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Loves a New Life. Late that night, after the two men had left, Charmian and I sat together over the bedroom fire and talked and talked. Her lips were opened now, and she could talk without the old restraint it seemed a relief to her to talk i asked if edward had ever discovered who was the sender of the fatal letter no she said 
not actually he's practically certain but he did not trouble to bring it home the mischief was done any one who had a heart must have been sufficiently punished by the knowledge of the misery she had caused he left her to that but oh evelyn what a conception of love to try to poison a man's home because he had chosen another woman as his wife not that i am much better i have no right to speak her lips quivered she confessed to me that on reading the two letters she had been overcome with sorrow and remorse but that edward had refused to listen to her laments they had both been wrong each had an equal need of forgiveness the suffering in either case had been intense not another moment must be wasted away with bitterness away with remorse the future lay ahead it should not be wasted in vain regrets then blushing in a glow she told me her plans to-morrow to-day she raised her eyes to the clock and glowed anew we are going by train to a sunny bay in cornwall to spend a second honeymoon edward's riding engagement could be fulfilled better in the country than in town he had lingered in london for thorold's sake not his own one month two months to themselves they must have and then she straightened herself as in eager anticipation america i must take him back evelyn back to his old home and his old friends to let them all see oh all my life must be spent in making good to the shame i have brought upon him the misery and blame i laid a restraining touch on her arm remember you are not to grieve you've promised that is forbidden ground yes yes i know but my heart evelyn my heart will always remember she turned to me tenderly darling girl we talked about you it is through you that this happiness has come we cannot be parted when we are settled in our new home we want you to come over to pay us a long long visit you could see your sister too you would enjoy that i felt a momentary rising of bitterness a momentary impulse to say caustically that it would indeed be soothing for a lonely woman to visit two devoted married couples but there was a wistful tone in her voice which showed that she understood i made a big effort to laugh naturally and made a vague promise this was charmian's night i should be a poor thing if i dampened her joy and about pastimes she said slowly the agreement stands of course i pay half expenses for the next three years live in it lend it rent it as you think best i should love best to think of you living there until you come to us you could find some friend oh yes i have made enough friends at the mansions to keep me supplied with visitors for months to come if i go back but i'm not sure this has come upon me with a rush charmian i shall have to sit down and think quietly i shall see you again before you sail of course she looked at me with reproach you are the dearest person in the world to me evelyn except one do you suppose i could leave england without seeing you again we'll arrange a meeting somewhere and have a week together you and i and mr thorold and edward she turned a sudden scrutinizing glance upon me evelyn i have a haunting conviction that you are changed that some man has come into your life you aren't by any possibility going to marry wenham thorold indeed i am not he hasn't the faintest desire to marry me or i to marry him we are excellent friends but nothing more i honestly believe he regrets miss harding you are growing too personal my dear i shall go to bed she laughed kissed me but refused to move i'm not tired i don't want to sleep sleep means forgetfulness she said it will rest me more to remember i left her leaning forward with hands clasped around her knees gazing into the fire charmian left the next morning and i prepared with the strangest reluctance to turn back into miss harding and return to the basement flat 
for the last week i had been living in an atmosphere of romance which had put me out of tune with ordinary life bridget showed her usual understanding deed i always did say a wedding was the most upsetting thing in life she declared a funeral's not in it for upsetting your nerves and setting you on to grizzle the same as a wedding not not that mrs fane's palette i suppose was a wedding exactly but it sort of churned you up more than if it was to see her all a-smiling and a-flushing and looking so young her as always held herself so cold and now to have to go back to live underground with you mumping about in a shawl cheer up bridget dear i said soothingly it won't be for long i feel myself that i need a change perhaps we'll go to ireland the aunts are grumbling because i don't go just a few weeks more while i think things over and make my plans make the best of it there's a good soul she looked at me more in sorrow than in anger oh i'll make the best of it with the best when there's a call to do it she said firmly but you'll only be young once my dear you may throw away things now as you'll pine to get back all the days of your life when you're thinking things over just remember that she stumped from the room leaving me to digest her words the next week passed heavily i saw little of mr thorold and suspected that the revelation of evelyn would work against further intimacy it was impossible that he could feel the same freedom and ease impossible that he should commandeer my help as he had done in days past there was no blame attached to the position it was natural and inevitable but the loss of the easy pleasant intercourse left a gap in my life miss manners had gone with her children to visit her mother mrs travers cut me in the hall poor miss harding was having a bad time nobody needed her her absence had passed unnoticed her return awoke no welcome bridget besought me to go out and amuse myself but i obstinately refused to go and stayed glued in the flat not for words would i have acknowledged it to a living creature but i was afraid that while i was out some one might call ralph maplestone had said that business would bring him to town now that the merryvales were in switzerland and that anxiety was off his hands he could come when he liked if he did not come it must be because he did not like the reflection did not help to raise my spirits nor to pass the long hour days but it did give me an insight into my own heart for the first time i was honest with myself and acknowledged that i wanted him to come i faced the possibility that i might wait in vain and felt suddenly faint and weak it had come to this that i needed his strength that i felt it impossible to face life without him by my side i determined if he did come to show signs of weakness in my resolution possibly to go so far as to arrange a meeting with my niece he came one afternoon when i was darning stockings by the dining-room table and the disobedient orphan showed him straight in on the domestic scene i hurriedly hitched round my chair and drew the casement curtains making an excuse of too much sun then folded the shawl round my shoulders and sat at attention he said he was pleased to see me was i quite well the weather was very bright good news from switzerland wasn't it general underwood was suffering from gout what were miss wastney's plans for the summer oh she doesn't she she doesn't know herself i sighed vaguely circumstances uh, have altered her friend mrs fane i realized that escott would have to hear some explanation of charmion's departure but was loath to set tongues wagging has decided to return to america she has spent most of her life there and has many ties he looked supremely uninterested mrs fane might go to kamchatka for all he cared and will miss wastneys keep on the house alone nothing is decided but i think not he looked unperturbed showing none of the agitation i had hoped to see 
does she intend to join mrs fane in america now i felt hurt obviously oh quite obviously he did not like me so much as he did it was nothing to him where i lived nothing to him where i went a terrible feeling of loneliness overwhelmed me nobody cared i pressed my lips together to prevent their trembling behind my spectacles i blinked smarting eyes a big brown hand stretched out and was laid over mine a big soft voice asked tenderly evelyn how long is this tomfoolery to go on we were standing facing one another across the table i had darted behind its shelter in that first moment of shock and dismay his face was lit with a mischievous smile his hands were thrust into his trouser pockets his eyes surveyed me with a horrible twinkling triumph oh oh oh, oh y y you know course i know you've known all the time from the very beginning not just at first i'll give you credit for taking me in for a short time a very short time then you gave yourself away how how when you do a thing at all you ought to do it thoroughly your disguise was incomplete incomplete but i had lessons i paid to be taught then your instructor whoever he may be omitted one important item the moment i noticed it the whole thing became plain i knew i was talking to evelyn wastneys and not to her aunt i remembered the sudden flashes of complacency which had mystified me so completely this was the explanation i was devoured with curiosity what was it you must tell me your hands he smiled showing his strong white teeth your pretty hands with the dimples and the pink nails and the sapphire ring oh. i looked down at the big square stone in its setting of diamonds and felt inclined to stamp with rage at my own forgetfulness it was my mother's engagement ring and for years i had worn it every day to my new friends of course it had no associations but for this man who had noticed it on evelyn's finger who had gazed with a lover's admiration at evelyn's hand the clue was unmistakable so far as ralph maplestone was concerned all my care all my pains had been rendered useless by that one stupid little omission i stood dumb and discomfited and the chippendale mirror on the opposite wall reflected a round-shouldered figure a spectacled disfigured face i felt a sudden overwhelming impatience with my disguise for pity's sake evelyn run away and turn into yourself came the command from the big voice it is extraordinary how he follows my thoughts i can't make love to you in those things i don't want you to make love to me i said and lied but i do you see and it's my turn i've waited long enough he crossed the room opened the door and stood with the knob in his hand waiting for me to pass through i stiffened my back and stood still i told myself that to give in after that meant that i agreed practically gave my consent i would not do it i would not i would stand all day rather than move an inch nothing should induce me he rattled the knob and stared steadily in my face i turned and went evelyn wastneys will you take this man to be your wedded husband i had come back again in my blue dress and he met me on the threshold where i verily believed he had been standing waiting all the time i changed he took both my hands in his and asked the question so deeply and seriously that it brought the tears to my eyes i i think i will i said shakily but you must not be too sudden with me please because i was so certain that i never would you must give me time to get used to the idea you can really love me you can really manage to care i can the difficulty lately has been the other way when you didn't come i was afraid 
i had a horrible conviction that you'd changed your mind he laughed and drew me closer wrapping me close in his strong arms i lay still and felt as if all my burdens were rolling away and a big strong barrier hedged me in and protected me from the buffets and responsibilities of life it was a blissful feeling full of joy full of rest now it seemed worth while having been a lonely woman no sheltered home living girl could possibly have rejoiced as i rejoiced you are mine i'll take care of you no more rushing about and living in disguise i don't want to ramble never did i want a home and my own man do you remember when you said you would give me my own way in reason and you objected that i would wish to come first i do bless your lonely heart so do i i'm afraid i shall spoil you ralph oh do he cried and there was a hunger in his voice that sank deep in my heart he needed me how good it was to know that to realize that in all the teeming millions in the world no woman could be to him that i was later on after a blissful interlude i began to ask questions what will your mother say will she be surprised she'll be delighted for my sake and her own at the bottom of her heart she has always longed to be with her girl and she's prepared she recognized the signs as charmian did in me why do we show it in our faces of course we do why not love's a new sense a new life if one has any expression at all it must show i've gone about feeling as if i were labelled evelyn wastney's by express route for a year past now i've got you you're coming back to take care of me at the hall i rather like the idea of myself as mistress of that old house with my head on his shoulder i devoted several moments to the consideration of how i should arrange the drawing-room it was amazing that i could not conjure up one pang of regret for dear pastimes there's a lot to be done first i told him two homes to break up i shall have to find new tenants what about general underwood for pastimes he asked i raised my head and looked at him he was manfully trying to smile wretch i exclaimed so you've got your way after all End of chapter 26 The Lady of the Basement Flat by Mrs. George D. Horn Vasey